morning. Go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 1. And as you're turning, I'll, I'll just say it's, uh, in case I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, I'm uh, Mike Dean, the interim pastor, the new interim pastor here at Real Life Church. And I'm looking forward to getting better acquainted with you in the days to come. And I'm finally glad to be here on a regular basis and uh, to be able to join you and to walk alongside the elders and the pastors and staff to, uh, to help shepherd the church during this transition uh, season. And we're expecting God to do great things. Philippians chapter 1, I'm again reading in verse 1. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. So for the next several weeks, we're going to camp in this portion of uh, the New Testament, this letter that Paul wrote to um, the church in the ancient city of Philippi. And, uh, and these ver verses that I've just read give us some of the background information that we're going to need. And over the next several weeks, as we're going through this series, I'll tell you a little bit more about Paul's unique relationship with the church there as he writes this letter. He, he talks, you may have noticed as we read, he talks about being in chains. And so he is writing from a Roman prison. I think it's interesting that Paul is writing such rich truth locked away in a Roman jail. In fact, I've entitled this series, Unchained. Unchained. For Paul is um, confined physically. He is uh, in bondage physically. But spiritually, he is as free as a human being can be. And so we're going to talk about that. His life is just consumed with Jesus. That's what makes it bearable for him. That's what makes um, this something fruitful in his life. He's in chains, he's in the jail, but he has this passion for Jesus. One of the things you're going to see as we go through the book of Philippians is that there are 104 verses in the book. And in 50 of them, he mentions Christ or Jesus or the Lord or some reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. About one out of every two verses, he's got Jesus on his mind. And that's the secret to living a life that is unchained, is to have this full passion for Jesus Christ. Now, the other thing that is apparent here as you read these verses is his deep affection for this church. I think maybe it might have been his favorite church. Of all the churches that Paul planted and, and supported, I, I think maybe this might have been his, his favorite church. And uh, we read about the initiation of uh, his relationship with the people in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. You might go there for your homework this afternoon and read that passage of Scripture, how Paul and his missionary team on his second missionary journey, came to Philippi. And some amazing things happened there. He meets a lady by the, by the river who uh, becomes the core of the church as she comes to faith in Jesus Christ. There's a story about this Philippian jailer who's miraculously converted when he hears Paul 
uh, and his uh, brothers praising the Lord in the night. There's a slave girl who's dramatically healed. And that gets Paul into hot water. There's a lot of adversity from the very beginning. He's not with them very long. And yet the, the relationship that is forged in that short time that they were together caused this church to be tremendously fond of Paul and Paul to be fond of them. This, you see this deep affection that he has for them. In fact, so much so that when Paul left after a short period of time, the church there in Philippi uh, decided that they wanted to share in his gospel ministry. You, you picked that up as we read the verses earlier, how even in that short period of time, they became committed to furthering the gospel of Christ by, by their financial support of Paul. And, uh, and, and in fact, the book of Philippians is uh, a, a sort of thank you note. It's a four chapter thank you note that Paul is writing to them for their support that they've given him in the gospel ministry. The other thing you're going to see as we go through the book of, uh, of Philippians is that in the background there's this, this background music of joy that uh, just uh, comes through over and over again. We're going to hear Paul saying rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. It may not be the theme of the book but it's certainly the background music to uh, the book of Philippians. Now from the very start you see that this is a prayerful letter. Paul is committed to praying for them. He has affection for them and this affection for them overflows in fervent and continuous prayer. We pick that up back in verses 3 and 4. He says, I, I thank my God every time I think about you. Every time you come to my mind, I just have to stop and thank God. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. So this is a prayerful letter. He's letting them know, I'm praying for you. You know, that's one of the best things you can say to someone in any circumstance in their life, good or bad, I'm praying for you. And that is uh, the note that Paul begins this letter. It's a prayerful letter. And I, I love the fact that here they are separated by hundreds of miles. Paul is in Rome, Philippi is in, uh, in right there on the edge of, of, of Turkey, modern day Turkey, He's hundreds of miles away from them but he can still have an impact, he can still have influence in their lives through his praying. I'm reminded that prayer is life's limitless reach. There may be someone that you're concerned about, someone you love, someone you have affection for, maybe it's a child or a parent or uh, someone in your life that uh, is in need. Now, you may not be able to go physically to them, but you can go spiritually to them and have an impact in your life through prayer. Prayer is life's limitless reach. They can be on the other side of the world, and you can have a touch on their life. Prayer. Hudson Taylor uh, is one of my spiritual heroes. He was the founder of the China Inland Mission. And uh, living in England in the 1800s, preparing to go to China, he determined that he was going to have to learn to live by faith before he went to China to form the China Inland Mission. And this is what he said about that preparation that he made. He said uh, in his biography, when I, when I get out to China, I shall have no claim on anything or anyone. My only claim will be on God. How important to learn before leaving England to move man through God by prayer alone. Isn't that interesting? To move people by God through prayer alone. Prayer is powerful because God is powerful. That's what Dawson Trotman, the founder of the, the Navigators Ministry said. He said, in helping others, if you start with prayer, you start with God, and when you start with God, you start right. It's a good thing to remember. So I want us to focus on this prayer that is found in, in verse 9. He says, and this is my prayer. I like it when it's that straightforward. This is what I'm praying about. This is what I'm asking God to do in the life of my family, and my friends, and church family, and people that, uh, that have need. Praying for yourselves. You're going to notice as we walk through this 
short prayer that it's a scriptural prayer. You know, one of the things as you read through the New Testament, through, actually through the Bible, you will discover that there are many prayers that are recorded there. And I think it's a powerful thing when we are able to pray the prayers of the Bible. You know, there's one of the prerequisites for answered prayer is to pray in the will of God. And there is nothing that is more in the will of God than the Word of God. And so it's a scriptural prayer. And I think it's a great practice for us to learn to pray the prayers that are in the Bible. It's a good place to start. The other thing you're going to to notice about it is that it is a spiritual prayer. It's a spiritual prayer. You know, oftentimes our praying, we pray for physical things, for, for healing, for finances, and things like that, and it's important that we do that. But how often do we really bear down in our praying about the spiritual needs of the person? That's what you're going to see here in this short prayer. There's nothing in here about praying for healing or food or anything else. He's he's praying about their most important need, the need for God to move and work in their lives. It's a spiritual prayer, and it's a specific prayer. He's he's asking God specifically for what what he needs God to do in their lives. You know, it's, it's, it's not enough for us just when we think of someone to say, well, God bless them. Lord, would you bless them? I mean, that's certainly not wrong to pray that way, but there's so much more that we can ask. And so praying like this, following the scriptural pattern, we, we can have a, a, a list of specifics to pray for. So if you want to just jot these things down, we provided for you a, um, a note sheet, and I encourage you to jot these things down if you, you really want a pattern to pray for yourself or to pray for other people. It's a rich prayer. First of all, I want you to notice that it is a it is a prayer for the full experience of God's love. It's a prayer for the full experience of God's love. You see that in verse 9. He said, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, Paul would say later in the New Testament that the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. It really, at the bottom line, that's what our life in Christ is to be. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second commandment is like it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus would say it a little differently in his teachings that uh, that you would love one another as I have loved you that's a a command and so it's pretty straightforward this is this is at the heart of what we are to do and be as the people of God to grow in our love for the Lord and but but he's talking here about the full experience of that love so we're just sort of living on the surface you know it would have been fine if he said I pray that your love would abound more that's good but he says it's, it should superabound more and more. There's, the love of God is this vast ocean. And we're just sort of uh, walking around in ankle deep water when there's a vast ocean before us. He said, I want you to, to know this love is sufficient. It's excessive and extravagant love. And, uh, and, and our greatest need in our walk with Christ is to mature in that love now paul is feeling this this love that he has for them he talks there about the affection that he has verse 8 he said i can testify how long for all of you with the the affection of christ jesus he's he's feeling the love of jesus in his heart for these people and that's what we need is for that love in us to be so real so profound so fully experienced that it overflows into the lives of other people. I, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now notice he says this, this love is rooted in knowledge and depth of insight. You see that in verse 9? In knowledge and depth of insight. So as we grow in our love for God and our love for others, we will be able to understand more fully what is right and wrong. That's what he's talking about here. This knowledge 
and depth of insight has to do, it's moral, it has to do with what's right and what's wrong. I was thinking about this and how in the world does it apply to us? And the fact is that loving someone is not simply accepting them. Sometimes the most loving thing we do for someone is to speak the truth. So our love is rooted in knowledge and depth of insight, a knowledge of what is right and what is wrong so that we can properly pray for other people and we can properly love other people based not on some false acceptance but based on the truth. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone is to tell them the truth. And so this love that he's talking about here is, is based on that. This love is not selfish love. A lot of times when we think about love for someone, and by the way, it's the word agape. It's not family love that the Bible talks about, friendly love that the Bible talks about. He's talking here about the passion, the love that God has shown us in his son Jesus Christ. And that is perfectly displayed upon the cross of Jesus. That God so loved that he gave. And that's what this love is. It is giving love. It is sacrificial love. It's not selfish love. And so, the Holy Spirit will prompt us to pray in this way. You know, the, the Bible says that, that we don't know how we ought to pray. We're weak in that regard. But the Spirit helps us in our praying teaches us how to pray and he's teaching us here we pray for the full experience of God's love the second thing that he's asking God for here is uh, it's a prayer for clear discernment of God's will clear discernment of God's will that's such, a, such an important thing we can pray for others he says that in verse 10 he says so that you may be able to, to discern what is best now, this word discern here is different than the word back in verse 9 of, of depth of insight. You might think, well, maybe they're the same thing. Well, not exactly. Depth of insight has to do with differentiating between what is right and wrong. And here, the, the word discern means to differentiate between what is good and what is best. The NIV 1984 that I'm using translates it that way. Discern what is best. The the ESV, I think, uses the word excellent. That, that you may be able to understand the excellence of God's will. I was in a Starbucks a while back, and I happened to notice while I was waiting on my coffee to, uh, that there was a, a, a little placard in the back. Somebody had scribbled on a, on a piece of paper the words, let's be excellent with each other today. Let's be excellent with each other today. That's a good goal, isn't it? So we need to be able to discern the difference between what is good and what is best. We spend a lot of our time on what is good. Are we focusing on the best? Learning how to love people in that way. Several years ago, uh, we moved into a new house in Texas. And just as we were getting ready, we had closed down the house, getting ready to move, uh, Nan, my wife's uh, dad, uh, suffered a heart attack. And so she had to go to be with him. And while she was gone, I had this uh, crazy idea that it would be good for just to go ahead and move us. And I thought she'd be impressed with that. <laughs> and so I hired a moving truck and some workers, and we moved to our new house. I moved us to our new house. Well, Nan finished up caring for her dad, and she flew back home. I went to the airport to pick her up, and I said, well, why don't we just swing by the house for a minute and, uh, before we go to uh, the place where we were living at the time. So I pulled in the driveway, and I thought, she's going to be so impressed with this. So we walk into the door of the house, and she begins to cry. And I thought, wow, I have really done something impressive here. But I soon discovered that those were not tears of joy. They were tears of bewilderment. She walks in and there are stacks and piles and mountains of boxes everywhere. And she was overwhelmed by this. And I realized that might have been a good thing. It was not the best thing to do. 
that she needed to make her nest the way she needs to make her nest. It wasn't that smart of me to do that. So this is the kind of discernment that we need in loving other people and following the will of God. What, not just what is good, but what is the best. And again, if we will listen to the Holy Spirit, he will prompt us in that. So we pray for a full experience of God's love. We pray for clear discernment of God's will, what's best. And number three, it is a prayer for the fulfillment of God's holy purposes in our lives. God's holy. Well, now we need this discernment, verse 10, because or so that we may be mature and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. So God is working out his holy purposes in our lives. And he's doing it every day and in every situation. In fact, he makes reference of that back in verse 6. He says, being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You realize that Jesus always finishes what he starts. And what started for you when you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ and received this gift of eternal life, what started then for you, Jesus has obligated himself to finish all the way to the day when Jesus comes again. And so this is encouraging to us as, as individuals, but I think it's also encouraging for us as a church. It's encouraging for us as individuals because to know that, you know, our spiritual lives are like this, up and down and up and down and up and down, but God's holy purpose for our life is consistent. He saved us by faith and grace. He is sanctifying us, working in us to make us more and more holy. And one day he's going to glorify us. One day he's going to come again and we're going to receive new resurrection bodies that are completely free of sin and for eternity we will stand before him and with him in pure holiness. Now that may not be the, the pattern of your life now, but that's where it's going. And Jesus has obligated himself to finish what he started when he saved you. That's encouraging to me individually. But this verse is also encouraging to us as a church. It was written to a church. And Paul said, I'm confident of this, that God began a good work in you. Back in Acts chapter 16, when he goes there and starts this church, he began a good work. And he's going to bring it on to completion until the day Christ comes again. And we've been through some bumps in the road at Real Life Church. God isn't finished with us. He always finishes what he starts. There's a new day coming, and we can be hopeful and encouraged in that. Now, what is this purpose that he's looking for? He's looking for us to be pure and blameless. That word pure is a word coming out of the ancient world. You know, when people went to pick out pottery, pots, and everything happened in these clay plot, pots, sort of like shopping for fruit you know you sort of pick around and look for fruit that looks right and looks best and when you were shopping for for clay pot you would do the same thing the word actually means to to be without flaw in the light it means to hold up something into the light so if you were buying a a pot a, a jar or whatever you would hold it up into the light to see if there are any cracks in it it had cracks in it, it wouldn't hold water, whatever else you want to put in it. So it means to hold something up into the light and find it to be flawless. That's what he means here, pure. That word blameless has to do with uh, not pushing someone in the wrong direction, literally. There's this kind of righteous living where we're not causing other people to stumble. So we're pure in our relationship with God, blameless in our relationship with with other people that vertical and that horizontal God's holy purpose for us is to grow in those two ways pure and blameless and could I just ask you today are there any habits in your life any besetting sins that reveal a lack of purity in your relationship with God but he sees everything doesn't he in the light of his holiness all of our unholiness 
is apparent. Are there any besetting sins, sins that you just have uh, excused and justified and yet God is saying that's, that's not good for our relationship and it's not good for your example to other believers and other people. He's saying today, my holy purpose for your life is I'm not going to let you be comfortable in your sin so that we can be pure and blameless. So it's a prayer for the full experience of God's love. It's a prayer for, for the discernment of God's will. It's a prayer for the fulfillment of God's holy purposes in our lives. And by the way, what better thing can we pray for our kids? God's holy purposes would be fulfilled in them. That they would be pure and blameless until Christ comes again. The final part of this prayer is it's a prayer for the fruit of God's glory. Fruit that displays the glory of God. He says in verse 11, filled with or having been filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now there's an important principle that we find here in these verses, a principle in the Christian life that we have to understand. How is it that a person can become pure and blameless in the sight of God? One answer is man's religion. And in man's religion, we work really hard, we try to do good, and hope that we've done enough. I was reading about a um, prominent politician who was in an interview with a person on a news program, and this topic came up about how a person gets to go to heaven. And this politician said, well, if I'm good, I go to heaven. And if I'm not, I go someplace else. Now, that, that sounds commendable, but you stop to think about it for a moment. How do you know if you've ever been good enough? And by the way, whose standard of goodness? If God is the standard of goodness, that there's not a one of us that has a chance. We're all toast. Man's religion won't cut it. I can never be good enough. I have a, a sin problem that I can't fix no matter how hard I try to be good. So, man's religion is one way to accomplish this, to become pure and blameless. But the best way and the only way is through Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness. It's where I admit that I can't do good. As the Bible says, there's none good, not even one. The best of us falls far short. And so, what do I do? I stand before a holy God and I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I fall short every day and in every way. But that God loved me so much that he let his son die on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for my sin so that when I put my trust in him, my sin is put on Jesus and his righteousness is put on me. And out of that righteousness then that has imparted to me, I can live out a life So it's Christ living in me that makes the difference. It's not me trying to be a good person. It's Christ living out his good life through me as I trust in him. It's like this glove. Now I can can command that glove to pick up my Bible. I can command it all day long. (laughs) But you know, it can't do it. It's just not able, just a piece of fabric. But if my hand goes inside that glove, then I can pick up my Bible. It can accomplish something. And the same thing is true without Christ. We're just like an empty glove. We can't accomplish We can't be pure and blameless. It's only until Christ comes to fill our lives and to live in us that we, as he says there, that we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that is, is put into us so that we can then bear the fruit of a pure and blameless life that comes through Jesus Christ. And notice, it is to the glory and praise of God. You see, when your life is man's religion lived out, and you manage to get it right from time to time, and you're good, 
And people might say, man, she is a good person. But when we talk about Christ's righteousness, the glory does not come to us. As Jesus said, let others see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So they see the goodness that comes out of our lives. And they see that it's not something we produce. It's something Christ has produced in it. It's fruit that has come through Christ. What a great way for us to pray. So I, I, I think it's appropriate for us just right now to pray this for ourselves. So would you just bow your head with me, please? And, and remember that praying the word of God is praying in the will of God. This is what God wants for us. And if you truly want this and ask God for this, he will produce this in your life. So number one, would you just pray right now for the full experience of God's love? Ask God for you to experience more and more of his amazing love. And that you might be able to love others with excellence. And then we pray for the ability to discern God's will. Caleb reminded us earlier about that promise in Proverbs 3 that we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and don't lean on our own understanding. But look to him in all of our ways and he will make our path straight. He will direct our path. Are you facing an important decision today? Maybe it's a decision between what is good and what is best. Would you ask God to give you that discernment? And then... Would you ask that you might fulfill God's holy purpose? Your relationship with God and your relationship with others to be pure and blameless. That you're not just coasting. That you're serious about your walk with God. That His holy purposes would be full, fulfilled in your life and then fruit is there is the fruit of Christ likeness being born on your life can others see and, and sense the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and self control and all those other things people see Jesus in you and glorify God Lord, I pray that um, you will do this work in us. Lord, we believe this is your word and this is your will. And we're believing this for, for ourselves and for one another. And Lord, thank you that you've made it all possible through the work of Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name. And we talk a lot about next steps here at Real Life Church. We, we want everyone to take the next step, and there's a next step for every one of us, no matter how far along you are in your, your walk with Christ. And so we want to help you in that, in that. And for some of you, that next step is trusting Christ. You realize that you've been basing everything on, on man's religion, and you've not really come to fully experience the righteousness of Christ. You need Jesus. And the next step for you is the most important step you'll take in life. And we want to just encourage you to, uh, to let us know. We want to, we want to know that, how we can pray for you and how we can help you and support you in that decision. You can text to RLC next to 77411. I think the information may be coming up on the screen. But if you'll just uh, text that information to us, we'll reach out to you. Or you can simply go out the doors here until you're right. 
is the next step center and you can talk with someone and we'll be happy to help you maybe the next step for you is believers baptism we're having baptism next sunday and that's a wonderful thing and you've uh, you've put your trust in christ but you've never publicly confessed him as your lord and savior through believers baptism big step in obedience if you'd like to sign up for that again just step around the corner to our next steps area would be happy whatever the next thing is for you we want to be there for you and walk with you in uh, your journey in the lord i want us to stand together now and just to worship the lord we've we've heard his word and now let's just respond to him as we sing